Good morning, North Palm. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Wow, man, didn't you like that Hammond organ? Whoo, boy, that was good stuff. So good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. What a great time to serve the Lord, to worship Him. The day that we commemorate His rising from the dead. I want to talk to you about that subject, that theme that we've had all morning, what the law could never do. I want to take your attention to Romans chapter 8, verse number 1. Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, reading through verse 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Take a moment, lift your hands with me. Pray this prayer. Holy Spirit, open my ears that I can hear what you have to say. Open my heart, make it receptive. I give you permission to move deep in my life to form my heart, to form my character. Jesus, have your way in me today. Amen. Well, this is such an incredible passage of Scripture that the Apostle Paul has written. You know, during the pandemic, we stood on Romans chapter 8, verse 2 where Paul said, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That was a scripture that God gave us. And so every time fear would attack me, every time it would try to jump on me, I would say that verse, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And when I would say that, the fear would leave. The preoccupation would leave. It didn't matter anymore. They'd say, don't go around people. Keep your distance. No. How can you do that and be in ministry? I mean, how can you do that and engage in life? There has to be a moment where your faith in the Word of God trumps fear. There has to be a time where what God said means more than what Dr. Fauci says. There has to be a time where the word is more powerful than the the WHO. And that is that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And that was the passage, that was the promise that we proclaimed every week when we would come together to meet during the pandemic, that verse, Romans chapter 8, verse number 2. And we saw it lived out. We didn't lose anyone during the pandemic. That's, that is powerful, friend. Because that's not the last time we've got to apply that. We have to live in the application of Romans 8 too. But, you know, what is the law of sin and death? What, what is that? The law of sin and death is the power and the authority of sin that rules in a life that is not submitted to Jesus. When the flesh is dominant, you are under the law of sin and death. The flesh is that old nature that refuses to rely on God and refuses to delight in his way. As Paul said, the carnal mind is at enmity against God. 
So if your life is not submitted to Jesus, then sin has authority over your life. Sin rules. Sin destroys. Sin overcomes. Sin annihilates. Sin defiles. Sin perverts. Sin imprisons those who are not walking in relationship with Jesus. The law of sin and death includes every curse that comes because man sin. When you're not submitted to Jesus, every curse comes into your life. Look at life in the garden before Adam and Eve sinned. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Think about that. No shame, no guilt, no condemnation, no fear, no sin, no death, no sickness, no disease, no pain, no tears, no sorrow, no heartache, no suffering, no curse. Literally the perfect man, the perfect woman, the perfect world. But then Adam sinned. And because of that sin, the curse came and was empowered. And sin brought with it shame and guilt, condemnation, death, fear, sickness, disease, pain, tears, sorrow, heartache, suffering, thorns, and thistles. All came as a result of sin. But Paul said in Romans 8 verse 13... For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, that's why it's called the law of sin and death. In Romans 8, 2, it is the law of sin and death because the person whose flesh dominates his life is ruled by the law of sin. And if you are ruled by the law of sin, you will die for the wages of sin is death. There will be condemnation for those who walk according to their old nature who are ruled by sin. But Jesus came. And Jesus did what the law could never do. But how? How did Jesus accomplish the reconciliation of sinful man to a holy heavenly father? How did Jesus set us free? How did Jesus make it possible for a broken man to be healed and become an instrument of God that has purpose and that has destiny? Well, Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Him. So there are four things that Holy Spirit is highlighting this morning. The first thing is the perfect sacrifice. The second thing is the perfect altar. The third thing is the perfect evidence. And the fourth thing is the perfect promise. Let's begin by looking at the perfect sacrifice. You see, thousands and thousands of lambs, bulls, and goats had been offered to deal with sin. But yet sin still reigned. The blood was applied, but the blood would have to be reapplied again and again and again. More animals had to be killed. More lambs had to be slain. More sacrifices had to be made because the sacrifice of bulls and goats and lambs was only a temporary fix. It could not remove the sin problem. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 4, 
Paul, the, the writer says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Listen, you need to understand Jesus came for you. Jesus, God, became man for you. It was for your sin. It was for your sickness, for your sorrow, for your suffering, for your rejection, for your abandonment, for your pain, for your guilt, for your condemnation. Jesus came because you were separated from the Father. So he is the perfect sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice was offered on the, poor, on the perfect altar, on the cross of Calvary. What Jesus did on the cross of Calvary is the greatest manifestation of love that has ever been shown to mankind. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Look at this. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Galatians chapter 6 Verse 14, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Listen to that same verse and a couple more in the New Living Translation. As for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in the world has been crucified, and the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things, for I bear on my body the scars that show I belong to Jesus. Wow. You see, the cross was the perfect altar because on that cross, the Son of God offered his perfect sinless sacrifice to become the perfect atonement for mankind. In 1913, George Bernard, who was a Methodist Episcopal minister and was also active in the Salvation Army, penned these words. He said, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. 
And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. He said, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to that home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross until my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to that old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. After Jesus' death on the cross, they took his body and they placed it in a borrowed tomb. And the tomb became the perfect evidence that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. You see, Buddha was cremated and a shrine was built over his ashes. Mohammed died and he was buried in the Green Dome or also called the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina, Saudi Arabia. The grave of Confucius is located in a large cemetery in Khufu, Shandong province in China, where over 100,000 of his descendants are also buried. But when you go to the city of Jerusalem, you will not find Jesus in a tomb. The tomb is empty. Death has been defeated. The grave has been beaten. Hell has been robbed. Sin has been annihilated. Sickness and disease have been reversed. Iniquity has been slaughtered. Depression has been trounced. Hatred has been whipped. Racism has been broken. Poverty has been massacred. Because the tomb is empty, Jesus conquered it all. Jesus conquered sin, conquered death, conquered the grave, conquered your iniquity, conquered your addiction, conquered your problem conquered everything that Satan would throw at you and say, I'm going to destroy him. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to make them suffer. Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm shedding my blood so that you can be saved. I'm taking the stripes in my body so that you can be healed. I'm going through all this horrible agony so that you can be free from depression and anxiety and fear and guilt and condemnation. That's what Paul meant when he said God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God in him. And so God is calling you There is a call going forth this morning for you to become evidence of his redemptive power. In Romans chapter 8, verse 10 and 11, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also Give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You see, the way that you live should shout, should testify to the world around you that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive in your words. 
Jesus is alive in your smile. Jesus is alive in your touch. Jesus is alive in the way that you walk. He's alive in the way that you practice your business. He's alive in your patience. He's alive in your kindness. He's alive in your joy, in your love. He's alive in your long suffering, in your meekness. He's alive in your self control. Your life becomes evidence like the empty tomb that confronts the world that Jesus Christ is alive. You become a reality of the resurrection. Your life. The perfect sacrifice made on the perfect altar showing the perfect evidence now leads us to the perfect promise. The perfect promise. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart Look at this, I will send him to you. I will send him to you. In John chapter 14, beginning with verse 12, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. John chapter 14 verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Did you hear that? He said it's to your advantage that I go away. Because the promise is when I go away, I will send another helper. And that helper will be with you forever. That helper will be with you when sickness attacks your body. That helper will be with you when the government says it's not legal anymore. That helper will be with you when the stock market falls, when it falters. That helper will be with you in your times of joy as well as your times of sorrow. That helper will not only be with you, but he will lead you. He will guide you. He will teach you. That helper will be with you because he will comfort you. You see, the word that's used is parakletos. And that's something that's attached to, comes alongside. You see, you can't shake the helper off. You can't avoid him. You can't run away from him. He's there with you. The devil cannot rip him away from you. The devil cannot steal him. The devil cannot imprison him or cause him not to be able to have access to you. He is the omnipotent Lord of glory. He is the omniscient Lord of all power. 
He is the one who is with you, who will lead you and guide you to the very end of the age. There's never going to come a problem that the helper will say is too big for me. There's never going to come a difficulty that the helper says, I just don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how you're going to make it. But the helper who is with you and who now is in you says God's making a way where there seems no way. The helper who is in you says with men it is impossible but not with God for with God all things are possible. And then when your world is falling apart and you're so burdened and so troubled that you don't know how to pray. You don't have words in the language that you can pray. The helper will intercede for you with groanings that cannot be uttered because he knows the mind of God and he intercedes according to the will of God. And God himself begins to pray through you back to God according to his will. And don't you know that when you pray in the Spirit, that prayer is always answered? Don't don't you get this? This all hinges on what we're celebrating today. The perfect sacrifice wouldn't be perfect if it wasn't offered on a perfect altar. It wouldn't be significant if there wasn't evidence. The evidence is secure. Jesus is alive. And because of that evidence, we have the promise of the Father. So you understand what God is telling you this resurrection morning? He's telling you there is not a mountain that you cannot climb. There's not a river that you cannot cross. There's not a valley that you cannot go through. There's never going to come a time where the enemy will defeat you because I am alive. I've given you victory. I've secured your victory. Because I am alive, you can live. Now, Luke chapter 24, verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. For you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The perfect promise. 